So the way this will work is I will be up here moderating and Will will be um, running around the audience with uh, a microphone for you to ask your questions. Before we get started, um, I'm just going to give faculty a second to introduce themselves to you once again. And again, if you weren't here earlier or you didn't see me waving, I'm Jody Ruvak. I'm program administrator um, who's working with um, Project IDEA and ELA in the state of Washington. So, Ursula? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear myself. Um, my name is Ursula Vollweiler. I'm an ELA and IBEST instructor in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, and I've been with IDEA from the beginning. So my colleague Courtney, I want to give a big shout out to uh, Courtney. Um, Courtney and I, we were with IDEA from the start. We were part of that first wave of colleges and uh, we helped write the first set of uh, modules. And then I stayed with it as also as a, a reviser. I revised modules and taught it. And now I teach ELA, um, intermediate ELA. So I use IDEA as, as a springboard for my lower students. And, and then I build my more advanced courses on top of IDEA. And that has worked really well. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Shannon Potter from Olympic College, and I was able to join the IDEA project in phase two and was very grateful for all of the amazing work that phase one instructors had put into it. And then I was also able to stay on as part of the revision team and see how, just to let you know, we are sort of representative of 60 some odd people who were a part of giving feedback weekly uh, through the three pilot phases. So being able to see the final product that came from that real on the ground practice and feedback in real time to, to bring you this final result, result, it's very exciting to share that with you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danica Garcia. I am presently at Washington State University and teaching in an IEP, but I came to IDEA about three years ago as part of um, the phase three pilot at Columbia Basin College. So a uh, shout out to my former dean, Daphne Larius, and my colleague and former lead, Cheryl Clem. And I was the t instructor for the pilot and then helped with the broader um, rollout of IDEA um, as we moved from a full IDEA to a tailored and provided a lot of advising and in-house training. So I'm glad to be here with you, and I'm very grateful for all the work of the folks that went before me in phase one and phase two. Hi, I'm Les Rivera from uh, Clark College in Vancouver, Washington. Vancouver, Washington, not BC, you know, Washington State, not DC. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's we're, not bad. Yeah, we're, we're right across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon. So anyway, um, Clark College, came on board in the second year after all these wonderful people that were the nine colleges before us did all that work and development. And we were involved in the last two years of the pilot and then we've been teaching it um, full time since then. I teach the full uh, 18 hour model in the morning and then there's another instructor who is an adjunct that teaches the um, slightly modified 14 hour model at night. And we sometimes, if our enrollment is strong enough, we have an afternoon class that's the full model as well. Um, the thing I really like about it is that it does incorporate just about everything you can think of. And I even use parts of it, particularly from the Writing Basics Grammar module for a traditional class that I teach at night at Portland Community College. So I find that it can really be used in regular traditional classes as well as in the IDEA class. And I love it and I'm so grateful to be part of it. I'm Adria Katka from North Seattle College, I'm just a little bit north of here, and um, I had the opportunity to be part of IDEA from the phase one, you heard that earlier. Uh, what do I need to say? <laughs> um, also have had uh, the pleasure and fortune um, of being involved through, again, the, these phases of revisions and um, refining and, and bringing the curriculum to where it is today. And I've certainly really enjoyed um, my work and ability to be able to stay connected with this project over time. Um, I also at North have had the chance to teach this in the full mod model, um, the 18 hour model that um, 
Will has, has gone over and that we'll talk a lot about over these couple of days, um, but also, as Les mentioned, have been able to use a lot of these curricular pieces in more traditional type courses um, and turn those into web-enhanced courses by basing them on idea modules. Um, so even if it's not really a, a hybrid or um, kind of blended model, using it as a, as a class-based but also web enhanced course. Um, so anyway, just really glad to be able to be here with you. I'm going to take a second to um, pop back to that video that we watched from Amato a few minutes ago before the trail mix break. Um, and one of the things that has really kept me uh, very engaged in this work of the of uh, project idea has been that little key word that so many of us, um, so many of us in this room would probably list as one of our top goals for our students, which is empowerment. It comes up all the time. And when I see that, that snippet of Amado, I'm always reminded of how empowered he felt. And um, the other student that I interviewed that same morning, um, also I, I had written down and have never really forgotten a quote from her. She said, I feel strong and powerful when I can communicate. And man, that really does it for us ELL instructors, doesn't it? <laughs> There's nothing. It'll get you and it'll keep you forever. So anyway, thanks so much for being here with us and for investing your time with us for these couple of days. Okay. So Will, do you have any questions? I'm looking for hands. Specifically, ones in the air. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm wondering for programs like I know Clark. I met you at TESOL or something, and and I remember you mentioning that you had you were teaching um, ESL, but you were integrating math. And I was at a math uh, uh, workshop. Actually, it was really interesting. But I, do you break out the students? This is for EFL levels one, two, and three. Is that right? Do you do you break out the students, or is it um, multi-level? How does that work? Hello. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, and my class is a one, two, three, but it's it's a mix. It's a it's a multi-level class, and so. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm able to get a tutor, um, and so I have my tutor work with those students that are level ones more, and then um, I work with the ones that are two and threes a little bit more, but a few of them you know, will sit close to where I am at the podium, and so I can kind of see what they're doing and see what they're not doing, and so then when we have um, pair work, group work, or whatever, then I take time to sort of assist a couple of those low-level students. Um, I think that it works best from my experience with levels two and three, not as well with level ones. And we have another course at Clark called Foundations, which is a one, two, three class as well. So when I'm able to, within that first week, I try when I can to get at least a couple of the level ones to go back to that Foundations course first, and then come back to me an idea maybe a quarter or two later. And I think that's kind of ideal, though it isn't always possible. And um, it really depended on a campus by campus basis on how IDEA was offered. It is designed multi-level one, two, three without any, no activities identified as specifically level one or specifically level two. It's a combined class, but some campuses chose to convert, say, an existing level two class to IDEA. Some campuses chose to have a multi-level one, two, and three class. Others may have converted a level three class to ideas. So we left how, once the curriculum was developed, what classes they chose to offer it in um, up to each individual campus and program. And I'm going to actually um, open my class up to level four students as well. So ours will be hopefully a one through four. So I also had mixed level classes and I just want to let you know that there is a lot of flexibility on the part of the teacher when it comes to assessing uh, the assignments that are turned in and the grading rubrics that are there. So although the students would be doing the same assignment, the way you're going to assess how they've met the outcome of that 
would look very different for my level one student. If they got one sentence, uh, that might be, yes, they completed that for full marks. Where if a level three student had written the same sentence, I'm going to be expecting more of the level three. So depending on what the prompt is, but the, there are rubrics uh, on all of the assignments and that does give you a lot of flexibility in the class. Next question. Uh, yes, I wanted to know what assessment tool do you use to place students, level one, two, three? Um, CASAS is the predominant testing mechanism and then each campus also occasionally will do a writing test or some other sorts of assessments that they combine with the CASA scores in order to determine student placement. Thank you. The question was CASA's reading, listening, or both? Both. both. Yeah. Okay. Next set of. And yes, I can, I can run a cue. So you raise your hand and I put it in my head. He's really good at remembering stuff. Hi, Mark Coomer, Yakima Valley College here in Washington State. And I was just talking with Will over the, uh, during the break about attendance in general. And I'm curious with the idea model if that has had an impact on student attendance as it's impacted, had other positive impacts. Sure, I'll just say, uh, I feel like it helped to increase attendance. Um, students were so excited by what was happening in the class and there's a lot more application, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, problem-based and project-based pieces in the classroom. Um, and the technology that's also incorporated in the face-to-face -face that we're really excited about. And I will just say for, uh, for my students and my own experience, when they couldn't come, because of course life comes up and things happen, they were doing the online work. So although I maybe didn't get to see them face-to-face -face that day, they were coming and prepared. It was my experience. Just to echo Shannon and the students I, especially in phase one I worked with were um, primarily farm workers or spouses of farm workers. And so during a period of harvest, um, for those of you that work with farm workers, we all recognize that that is an extremely difficult time. And to add on what Shannon had said, I had students that were unable to physically come to class that actually for almost a month or two did all the online work and then showed up at class in the end and actually had, had accumulated enough hours for CASAS testing and made significant gains. Ideally, of course, we want to see the students in class, but it's great when they can continue to participate even though life intervenes with them being there and attendance was also very positive and very good. And then in addition to kind of that motivation and attendance, I do want to underscore that idea. I think it's really important that um, I, I do feel like this supports retention um, and has that sort of ability. It's one of those ways that we can often get students back, um, not necessarily as a calling them home, but but really um, just when it comes down to on a, on a personal level, I, I think we see a lot of students who will have a period of time that they need to be away and then they don't come back because they feel like they, it's been too long and I couldn't possibly, you know, we see that from many students and I think this is one of those ways that students can um, just maintain that feeling of contact, that feeling of connection with you as their instructor, with their classmates through participating in online discussions. Um, you know, it's, it's an intensive kind of class and we'll be talking, it, that will come out a lot in our conversations, but um, because of that, just by, by its virtue, it quickly builds a sense of community among students that they might not have in other class formats. Um, so I think just in all kinds of ways, it really enhances retention. I, I want to add one other important key word uh, to the empowerment, and that's equity. I think by having that online component, um, you have that equity piece because they can do the online component as many times as they want. It's not just once. Um, so some, some students will get it the first time and other students will have to do it three more times, but that really enables them to learn at their own pace. Even if they miss the, the classroom parts, they still can keep going at their own pace. It, in Alabama, we have the open enrollment model. How do you address that? Because I have students coming in, I have new students every week. <laughs> 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 
that's really common. I, I believe in Washington, open enrollment is very common. So at my school, they can come in until week seven. And I did ask for special permission on that class to, to stop it at week five. As, as you'll start learning, there's not many more modules that they would be participating in if they're post week seven. Uh, so what I found was really key is that when I had a technology coach, when I had the luxury of a technology coach, they were able to work with that student separately before the student came into my classroom. And I identified, as you'll learn later, there's a module that's the first week of every quarter called Intro to Idea. And that really is the, the groundwork to help them really access the pre-work and be able to do the technology piece. So what I did is I identified key, key pieces within that first week for them to work through with a volunteer, a tech coach. There were times it was just me in my office and, and having that one-on-one -on -one time with them to catch them up to speed. And then I would just say, your starting point is here. So if you're coming in in week four, you're welcome if you feel like you have the time to go back and look at the previous weeks, but I just want you to start from your day one. And I found that to be very successful. And I just make sure and touch base more with that student on the technology piece, just making sure they felt comfortable accessing that. But um, that works very well. And it is a challenge, but I think just establishing that starting date for them helped too. I, don't know if others have. I have a concern that if I say, you can't come in now, you have to wait three weeks that they won't come back. You know, that is a, because sometimes it takes a lot of nerve to come in the first time. Um, Courtney or Ursula, how are you handling the students? Are they still working like prior to coming in with Jan or something? Can you explain that a little bit? And I will just add one thing. Uh, we did also have somewhere else for them to go. So by not being able to enter mine, they just had to wait. They were still welcomed into class. So I do want to add that on. Yeah. <laughs> so Courtney, jump in. But we have, um, in Walla Walla, we have an orientation that runs on a specific day every week. And so students who come in even during the quarter, they have to do this orientation first. And that gives them a basic understanding of Canvas. And so when they come into the classroom, they already have that Canvas piece down. And, and so they're just uh, uh, adapting to, to the curriculum, but not the technology. And that has worked really well for us. And I don't know. So, you know, there are ways around it. Some of the programs in Washington are just managed enrollment and you come in by the first week or you don't come in all. Some are more managed open where students may enter for the first two to three weeks and then some are completely open enrollment through the whole quarter. Um, out of 34 providers, we had 33 participate in the pilot project and everyone found a way to make it work with how their enrollment system worked. So. Um, have you ever um, experienced students who come to class who haven't done the pre-work? <laughs> and how do you work around that? Anyone? I'm going to uh, start. Real, you, you will notice that very quickly because when you do your face-to-face, -face, uh, you first do a warm-up. Your first activity is always a quick warm-up, and that's where you will spot right away if somebody did the work or not. So it happens a lot. As I said earlier, even just with attendance, life happens. There's a lot of reasons that somebody isn't able to complete the pre-work. Uh, in my own experience, just setting up the expectation with them, please, if you're not able to do the pre-work, please still come to class. You are absolutely still going to be able to practice and learn, and you will gain information. It's going to be definitely enhanced and beneficial if you've done the pre-work and sort of laid the groundwork to come in for doing that. But I'd like to also add that I was quite flexible with my students and very upfront in the beginning about that as my policy. It was more important for me that they come to class and know it was okay to say to me, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it last night. Uh, and they really took the initiative and they would all say, but I'll do, I'll do it this weekend. I have time this weekend. And they did. I mean, maybe the occasional one who didn't, but really overall, you saw that they wanted to go home and do it for their own benefit. Um, so that I felt like if I could offer them that balance, I was still seeing them come to class and then they were catching up when they could. 
And I think it also becomes somewhat self-regulating in the classroom. The students start to become curious. Well, why is everybody else able to do this, participate in this in-class activity? I don't seem to understand it. And after a few times of that repeated and you, you talking with them, well, you remember you do your pre-work, it helps you get ready for class. They, the students that were a little more reluctant, um, were able to in, find a way to kind of self-motivate themselves, um, to complete the work. Anyone else? So actually, I had the exact same question there, but I did have a, another question that's related. Um, what, with our demographic, we have a lot of students that not only are not familiar with technology, which I understand it's the first part of the program is to teach them that, but d how do you deal with the students that just don't have computers or internet access at their house? One of the joys of the initial pilot was the colleges were able to provide every student with a laptop and 24 7 Wi-Fi um, so you know our providers had laptops that the students that they were able to supply the students post pilot how are you all handling laptops could you address that I find that um, usually all but about two of my students out of like 20 do you have internet access? So that's a blessing. But for those that don't, I just encourage them every day to either stay after class to use the Wi-Fi at the college or go to the library or go to the public library or, you know, go to Starbucks or something. And it seems like they're able to do that one way or the other. So that's how it works. Unless but a lot of them do have internet at home, which is really a blessing. Unless Clark is still checking computers out to students via the library, yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we um, all of the laptops that students use, they check out of the library at the college. And we've only lost one computer in four years, so that's pretty good. I found <clears throat> there's an app for Canvas, and so a lot of students were doing the work um, through an app or just using the mobile browser on their um, cell phone. And one of the things we talk about with IDEA is connections to the community. And the need to have internet or access to a computer after we completed the pilot when students were no longer able to take the computers home. Um, I did find students were signing up for library cards and spending more time on the weekends in the public library as well as the university library. Another option, too, that should be pointed out is what were described this morning or what will describe this morning was the full version of IDEA that was developed in conjunction with the Gates Foundation. Um, and then I believe he also briefly mentioned tailored IDEA. And with tailored IDEA or even full IDEA, you could run it as a web-enhanced class in the classroom only and possibly do one day of... Um, computer work one day of face-to-face -face work or half a class computer half a class face-to-face -face. so it is adaptable but what was originally described and what we're talking about as full idea is the fully flipped where the students do have the computers now that it's open you can tailor this to meet your needs we have someone from the audience who'd like to weigh in as well yeah i live in a small rural area where most of my students don't have internet and they do not have um, computers. Some have phones, but not all of them. So we're doing what uh, Jody said, we do tailored. <clears throat> and so um, I do about four or five modules a quarter. And um, I'm not saying I take the first hour. I found that it's easier and my stu students understand it better. Um, if we go through the activities kind of in class together, those that can do it on their own, do it on their own, those that need help filling in the blanks or more practice on the vocabulary or how to record. Some students never understand how to record the five words mm -hmm. and it's a lot uh, easier in the, in the tailored program because we can't give the computers out. People don't have internet access and it's just really too big of a problem to, to deal mm -hmm. with. So we just do tailored mm -hmm. and it works very well. All right, I've got a queue of four hands. I haven't forgotten you.
how do you market this? Um, and what I mean by that, students kind of know if it's a writing class, they know what to expect or conversation class, but it seems like you need to prepare students before they sign up for this class to have that idea of how different this is. We accept all idea-based puns here. We're, it's, it's open. We understand. <laughs> it happens. You can't help it. All right. Um, so in terms of there's sort of the marketing or just sort of, you know, what you say, maybe an alternate way of saying it is just how do you prepare students? How do you help them know what to expect? And of course, that's going to depend a bit on the model, the delivery model that you decide upon, whether it is, you know, if it is this very intensive 18 hour a week um, class, it is really critically important for students to understand that doing homework is, it's not a do it if you have time kind of thing, but it really is, that's part of your instructional time. So talking with students about that. Um, but I think, let me offer just a, a few thoughts or a few ways that I've seen some of this marketing or preparation go on and then I'm sure others can chime in. Um, for one piece that we did on our campus, it was really just a matter of, I think me writing up a, a half sheet with a description of what the class is and how it just, you know, a really basic written at pretty level two, three friendly language, but to explain what happens in this class and to try to make it clear that this class is all at the same time, a language class, a technology class, and learning about, I don't remember how I worded it, at some point I'll pull up the document, but it was learning about um, skills in your life or that kind, I didn't say life skills, but learning about different kinds of topics and giving maybe just two or three examples. We'll learn about study skills, we'll learn about time management, we'll learn about how to apply for a job. These, just offering some of those, we'll show the the chart or the big table with all of the module topics. And so I think being able to give students that idea that it's it's all of these things at once. Again, it's it's your English class, you're learning technology skills, and you're learning some kind of thematic content. Um, giving that is helpful. And that can be just delivered through um, other instructors kind of spreading the word to let students know. Um, or if you have some kind of an orientation model when students are tested and then they're looking at a list of options for classes that might be available to them at their level, having someone who's prepared to sort of explain what it is um, as they're explaining other course types. I think those are a couple of ways. Um, I'm, I'm going to pass the mic. I would say our main sort of marketing to it was during our orientation because this class did look quite different to what we were offering as our traditional classes as in like the schedule was different how many days a week it met um, the technology piece I think was a big seller quite honestly they were very excited that they were going to simultaneously be learning their technology skills along with the language so just in and of itself I think that kind of helped to sell it if you will through marketing in Walla Walla, uh, if you come to the, the level one to three day class, in Courtney's class, you don't have a choice. That's automatically the class. <laughs> you will end up there. And we have some other classes, like we teach during the winter, we teach uh, what's called Garrison Night School, and, we, uh, and uh, we have a few other options, but that's where students end up automatically. And what we've done is we've, we've really focused from the get-go on this guided pathways idea that when students come into the college, they are required to, to decide where they want to go with all of this. Do they want to get their GED, their high school 21? Where do they want to go? But what I've realized as an instructor is that and, and somebody actually said this at one of these, these training sessions, and it has stuck with me. They can't be what they can't see. And so idea is a wonderful way of showing them the opportunities that they have as they advance in college. And, and, and they pretty quickly realize that, and it helps them make those vital decisions as, okay, what's my next step? So um, even if they don't know what, what hits them on day one, they, they figure it out 
pretty fast how valuable this is. And then the, the word spreads through them. Yeah, at, at Clark College, our morning classes are usually four days a week. And we've um, structured the idea so it's three days a week. So we do three three-hour blocks to get the nine hours. And so that, to some students, is really a benefit because some students are working more. And so a three-day class is better than a four-day class. And Wednesdays is often early release in the public schools where I am. So we don't have class Wednesday. We have a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And so that helps some students be able to have some flexibility as well. So that's kind of a draw for our class. And like everybody said, the fact that you actually get a computer that you can take home and use, you know, 24-7 really is a big draw as well. Um, so I think those things are really important. And then the one thing I thought about um, getting back to students starting the class later during the quarter is that the wonderful thing about this program is that each of the modules are... Um, are not dependent upon the module before. You do have to have them, you know, do the first module, at least some of it, to learn how to use the computer, of course, and then a couple of other things. But for the most part, they can step in at week four, and they don't really have to have done the module in week two and three. So that really makes a big difference. Um, and I try to pair up a new student who comes a little bit later into the course with students that are level threes that are higher, so they can work with them. And so that really helps. Plus, I have the tutor, and I can work with them after class if they have time to stay. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you know this class really has a lot more flexibility, I would say. Just to tap on to what the other tap onto what the others have said, um, I think the peer to peer marketing aspect was huge. Um, you know, as we started to to expand at Columbia Basin, um, and I was teaching in the mornings in a in the section, I'd see. You know, students coming by the classroom kind of really poking their heads in and really looking to see why everybody else had all these computers out and what they were doing and why they were doing this other. And there was a lot of, you know, they'd be poking their head if they got a few minutes early to break, they'd be sticking a head in and there'd be a lot of chatter in the hallway afterwards and other students coming in and kind of asking me or not sure if they could ask me, but a lot of peer to peer, um, marketing, I guess I would say, from the organic focus of it. And the students thought it was fun. Um, and I, we, it took a few weeks for them to be convinced that it was fun if they were new because there's so much learning that goes on in the beginning, but they liked it. And I think that is, we, that is something that we cannot, no matter how we try to market or attract students, if they're not engaged with what they're doing in the classroom, um, all our other marketing efforts really don't work well. So I think the peer-to-peer -peer marketing was huge. And um, later there's been a uh, departmental-wide adoption of the curriculum. Well, I think you might have lightly touched on this, but um, are you able to count their hours when they're on the computer at home? And, um, and how do you do that? Um, one, I would strongly encourage you to figure out what your state's distance policy is. In Washington, we allow either learner mastery, clock, uh, clock time, or teacher verification. ID is based on the learner mastery model because, and I'll show, um, demo this tomorrow afternoon, but Canvas um, can be programmed in the grading scheme. So at the end, the students get a percentage for every module that equates to hours and at the end canvas will give you a final grand total of those hours i would never wait until the end of a quarter to report hours because then you could be missing students for post testing but it does vary a little bit because students can always go back and do work maybe when they have the aha moment a couple weeks later so the hours could fluctuate by week but it's they do get hours per module based on the percentage they earn You're in the queue, I've got you. <laughs> I'm gonna try to articulate my question. Um, I'm not sure that I, I have it very clear um, in my head yet, but I'm really curious to know, um, particularly um, for those of you who have, who started with phase one, at this point in time, as, are you able to identify, um, as you've evaluated your students, um, identify factors that contribute to um, their lack of making significant gains. Um, I'm really curious about this because uh, I'm, I'm not sure if 
I inferred this or Will intended this, but what I hear is um, this is better than the traditional ESL approach to uh, language teaching, and I'm kind of pushing on that at the moment. And so I'd like to know uh, if, if you've been able to think about or evaluate uh, in your program so far those things that are either barriers or factors about your student populations that are preventing them from succeeding in this type of curriculum. I know some things that have helped with IDEA are the fact that we have the rigor. Mm -hmm. There is more intensity and the students are in class for longer hours, but it's also giving the students the opportunity, like we were saying, if you can't make it face-to-face, -face, you can do the online. If you get behind on the online, you're in your face-to-face -face class. So there's two ways for students to access the material. The fact that they can continually go back and have access and repeat that material over and over again. So with Learner Mastery, it might take one student one time for 15 minutes, and they might understand the concept. Another student, it might take them three hours, but it's a level playing field because they're getting hours based on the percentage they're earning. So if the student who got it in 15 minutes maybe isn't having to redo it and redo it and redo it to just accrue a set of hours where the student who might not get it right away can keep going back, they can come in, they can work with their instructor, they can work with a volunteer. I think that's a big aspect of it, but I also think it's really raising the bar and showing students, you know, it's not okay just to come to class and chit chat with your friends maybe, or to take the same class. And I mean, we do have a progression policy here of three quarters, but it's, it's not okay just to keep repeating the same class and doing it. And hey, this is stuff you can actually take and use every day. You know, so we do have some topics like, you know, financial literacy and such that would be found in a textbook, but these topics were all brainstormed by Washington faculty, and it's like, what do you want your students to know so they can move? So students are reacting better to the topics also. Um, Barrier-wise, you know, maybe if they needed the computers and didn't have them or things, but we were able to mitigate a lot of those barriers by providing the internet access, by providing the Wi-Fi. I mean, we do have some rural areas where it's still a challenge, but we've also made the adaptation from going fully flipped hybrid to having the tailored model that could be done in a web enhanced class to mitigate those barriers for the students as well. Um, anyone else? Yeah, another thing I think is really good about it, about this particular course is that um, it's designed for four quarters for the whole year. And that means that even if the student, which a number of them do take the course more than once because they can take it three times and at Clark College a fourth time if I do an application, which is always um, accepted. Um, there, the first module, which is intro to idea about the, how the use of the computer in Canvas, and the last module, the end of quarter projects, is always the same. But those eight modules in the middle are different each quarter. So even if they're taking the class two or three times, they're getting completely different information. They're using the same format, so that really helps them because that becomes comfortable with them because they know how to do it. But they're getting new information every single week throughout a whole year of four quarters, which I think is really fantastic. I think th I think there's there's two, to jump onto what the others have said, there's two points that I was kind of that reflecting on as I was listening to the other speak. One I think that's really key is that the fact that there's an asynchronous component, that students can be doing the work at two, you know, their work distance at two o'clock in the morning or five o'clock or whatever time it happens to suit them, whether that's, you know, just in 15 minute chunks that they have time available. Um, so I think that's really beneficial in honoring the way that our students live and the complexities of adult life. Um, I think that's the first half. The second half when we're talking about rigor, as I've been reflecting again on the, the modules and the type of topics we teach, and now I'm teaching in an IEP program, 
And the topics I'm teaching in an IEP that are covered in the textbook are the same topics that we're looking at with this idea curriculum. So when we're talking about raising the bar and having students college and career ready. I think that that is huge. And the students are also recognizing, the students that are parents are recognizing, hey, the way you're teaching this is the same way my, my kids are being asked to do this at school. So getting that, that engagement from the students um, because they see the validity in what they're learning, um, I think helps with um, reducing barriers. For me, the big piece is contextualization. And I think, and, and I used to teach ESL the traditional way, and I, I taught grammar. And I think it's the same with math. Unless you contextualize grammar and math, students, it doesn't stick with them. They don't see the relevance of it. And I think the beauty with ideas that everything is contextualized. It's it's in a in a in a context that students live and breathe every day. And so the grammar all of a sudden makes sense. The math makes sense. And that's where I have seen uh, the biggest aha moments for me compared to the traditional model. I had a question. So my name is Wanda Billingsley. I'm the Dean of Education at the Monroe Complex, Correctional Complex. And so those of us in prison education, we have some unique barriers, some similar to our students who may not have the economic ability to have computers and access the internet. Ours is more legal. So in a prison setting, they are not allowed to access the internet. So that's a huge barrier for us. So I guess I'm more interested in picking your brains about how would you conceptualize this in a prison education environment? I heard some ideas about, you know, ways to offset some of the access issues related to computers in, you know, mainstream, but then what about restricted environments like this? Brian will actually be providing instructions on how to bring the IDEA curriculum into a corrections family environment, such as downloading the videos and relinking them. As MP4s, you'll have to convert Google Docs to Word Docs, etc. cetera. Um, but he had asked that I collect in that um, Google Doc in the classroom any correction specific questions so we can work together to figure them out. But there is a way to do it in corrections without internet access. I guess my question is, I, I have a variety of students. Some come from professional backgrounds, but I have some that come that maybe only went to third grade in their home country. How does that affect their ability? Not only do they have no English, they have no academic skills at all. I would say that I also have the privilege of teaching at one of the providers as well as that. I have students in a level one class who have a second grade education who are trucking right along with, and I have a different web enhanced curriculum that I'm using. I've seen them need a little extra assistance and help, but uh, those students in particular sat down and typed a 10 sentence paragraph by themselves the other day. Um, and I offered either I could type it for them or they could sit down and I mean, they knew how to do it. And it turns out they have the technology skills in their own language. Um, you know, they have phones. Granted, if they ask me for help, everything's in Spanish or Chinese or something. And I was like, can we put your phone back to English? Because I don't know what I'm reading to tell you what <laughs> buttons to click on. But they're getting the work done. But I really would say the one thing we generally say with idea is if a student's low in English and low in technology, I'd probably find something for them to do to skill build to transition them into an idea class. I wouldn't take students who are zero across the board unless that was really the only option and then you'd probably want to have volunteers or someone who could work with that student one on one and provide support in the class. Um, but it, if they have a little English and a little technology, they should be okay. And again, they might be able to might have to take the class a couple of times where and every time they'll get something a little bit different. Shannon? And then also just to go back to something that Ursula said earlier about the contextualization of the units for those students, because absolutely I have students who come in maybe with a second grade education. Uh, some of the units that just came to mind are study skills, time management, 
there's a stress management, you know, as they might be stepping back into school for the first time in a very long time and just learning how to juggle those responsibilities. So kind of woven into the curriculum, I think there's a lot of supports to help those students in particular kind of learn what it is to be a student, how to be a successful student, and that's just a part of the course that I think helps. I'm giving Les a heads up that in about 30 second, seconds, I'm going to ask him to talk about something <laughs> about foundations, so just think about it. Um, but I, I, before that, to give you time to warm up, um, I, I will also offer just, just an, another perspective on that, which is to say that um, for, for many students and actually for many of our faculty, when we're looking at a model like this that's innovative and really quite different um, from what many of us are used to either as from an instructional perspective or from a learner perspective. There's some, there's some things we have to undo or some kind of concepts that we have to sort of break through a little bit. Like, no, no, this, this can be what learning English is too. Um, it can look like this. And for a student who doesn't have a lot of preconceived notions about what that educational format would look like, nothing to undo. It really, you know, that's, I don't want to say blank slate. I mean, nobody's a blank slate. That's a ridiculous concept. However, um, it's just maybe, let's say, open door, right? And so, um, so a student who doesn't have that background may just be really open to, oh, this is how I, great, let me do it. Let's have at it. Okay, now I'm going to ask Les to come back and talk. He mentioned earlier something that I think is really important, and I almost always end up asking you or Brad or Monica to talk about this, because at Clark, um, they do have a really neat model um, that I was pleased to be able to go and observe at one point um, for a day or two some years ago, um, where they, they do this kind of, they call it a foundations class, and this is not only for their um, lowest level kind of preliterate learners, but really for anyone in those kind of beginning levels. But it, it's pretty unique, and I like the way that you have it working in tandem with IDEA, that it's, it's sort of another route, but it really is kind of, you know, Jody mentioned the idea of doing something as a sort of skill builder, and it's another thing that could serve, this kind of model could serve as sort of an on-ramp to uh, a program like this. Would you mind talking about it for a minute? Yeah, at Clark College, the um, foundations class is also a one, two, three, like ideas of one, two, three in terms of the level. Um, the difference is that the foundations class is a little bit uh, more beginning, and so the students that need a little more time to work on alphabet, a little more time to work on real basic reading skills, um, and do a lot of um, intensive um, pair work, intensive small group work, um, and a little bit of work on the computer. So I think, ideally, if a student is able to go through foundations at least one time, they would get enough of those basics down, hopefully, um, and they can take foundations two or three times, you know. Then if they came to IDEA, they'd already know how to use the computer a little bit because they do about an hour or two every week of some work on the computer and foundations. And their, their reading ability and just their, their comfort level with, with English language would be just a bit more. Um, and like, like probably a lot of other programs, we have some other things that support our students, such as um, tutors, that r tutors and some instructors, actually, that run a conversation um, hour every day that students can access after class. And so I try to encourage my students to go to that conversation hour if they can after class to help them reinforce their speaking ability and you know practice it more. And then we also have another class on Friday morning, which is a two-hour class that's a literacy class for levels one through four. And so if they're, if they're in idea and they're still really struggling, I try to get as many as I can to also go to that Friday morning class so they can get a little more help with reading, a little more help with writing. And just, you know, the more practice they get, the better, right? So we have as many options as we can, you know, put together in a week usually to help students. Um, well, I'm just going to point out one other thing, too. At the end of every module, and you'll see this um, as you work through the curriculum in the focus sessions, there's extra practice also. So students who are ready to move ahead might go explore on their own, or students who might need 
to work on additional grammar skills that were in that module or review the vocabulary or in some of the technology modules, typing tutors and whatnot. We've tried to provide access to some of that. So if you do need to provide extra support to your students, you don't need to go track that down. We've tried to find some of it from you. I mean, by all means, you can add your own things to it, but we did try to provide some additional supports also. Hi, uh, Chris Cotto from Chemeketa Community College in Salem, Oregon. Um, Self-proclaimed data nerd, so I love looking at the, the control group and the test group, and I love all of the um, comparisons between EFL level gains between the ones that were in IDEA versus the traditional classroom. And I was wondering if you have any, even if it's just anecdotal data about the employment uh, side of things. So after the exit of the program, the ones that went through the IDEA modules, whatever version they went through, um, what were any of the employment stats or the employability stats um, for the test group versus the control group? I think most of this will be anecdotal and um, I, some of the students that you heard in the video, obviously, we did not specifically look at, but that's a very interesting thing to look at is, you know, were we able to track that, but it's not one of the, our grant requirements, so it's something that w hasn't been on the radar, but I'm sure everyone's heard of students, even in the opening video, um, you heard from, well, one, uh, Julie Palomino, the instructor, who said her student came and turned in her laptop because she was able to fill out her job application and find a job, and then one of the students that was interviewed had gone to an interview and gotten a job. So, I mean, we do have the anecdotal evidence. So does anybody want to share about particular students? Um, for me, um, I teach uh, ELA level four and up. And when I get students from Courtney's classroom, there's just a vast difference. I mean, they just sail through it. Maybe one more quarter in my class, and, and they're off into pre-college English and then college English. I have students coming from her classroom to my classroom, and after one quarter with me, they're ready to take their uh, three-month uh, nursing assistance class and pass it. So I can see that just the students coming from her, they're used to the rigor they're self-driven. It's a completely different focus than, than students coming from the outside. I first have to create that routine with them. So I think they're just moving much faster up and out. Do you want to add to the employment? Or do you have a question? All right, does anyone else have anything to add to the employment first? No. I'm back to my queue. I have a question about the, how you arrange the hotspots, because that's an issue for many of our students, is lack of, even if, you, if they had the computer, they don't have access or hotspots at home or wireless. So the hotspots originally in the pilot, each provider received funding depending on what phase they came into the pilot to provide that laptop and that hotspot. What happened with the hotspots is every providers through their IT department negotiated. So some had Sprint hotspots, some had AT&T, um, some had Verizon hotspots. The price even within the providers varied depending on the regions. Uh, we had one Eastern Washington provider that where they offered the class, there is no Wi-Fi. A hotspot was not working. They um, actually had arranged something, and I don't know all the ins and outs, um, but the DISH network came and installed dishes for the hotspots at students' houses, and they were able to somehow get reimbursed through the college for the time they were in class. Um, and again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I do know that had happened. Um, that money's gone away in Washington also, so a lot of what we do now is show our students where the access points come from. But we do have an email in writing um, from Octe that says that mass, um, our federal grant funds can be used to purchase hotspots as part of an instructional package. So they would consider, say, a Chromebook, a hotspot, a corded or cordless mouse, a headset, 
in a case to be checked out and checked back in, that would be considered part of the instructional package. So there are possibilities that way. Um, again, we're not requiring the hotspots in Washington and haven't for over two years, and it seems to be working well. But we do have that option if we do have students in need. Anyone else? Also in Seattle, um, some of the public library branches apparently have hotspots that they're willing to lend. I, I don't know that that's by policy, but one of our teachers managed to, to negotiate that. And in some cases, they're also, I've heard of public libraries checking out computers to students. So I think it just depends on your area and checking out those resources. And I'll just quickly just add one quick thing onto that. If you're lucky enough to have resources on your campus, and I know we're all coming from different situations, whether it's a CBO or an offsite, but really going back to maybe something Danica said about connecting with the college community and making sure they know where the computer labs are and knowing how to connect to Wi-Fi. We are fortunate that we still have the laptops from the initial pilot, so I do have laptops to check out to them, not with the hotspot, but really trying to connect them to places both on campus and within the community where they can make that connection, and, that, and that's helped for quite a few. Will, before you grab another question, we have 10 minutes left, so if we can finish up the queue, and then we'll try to get to some of the questions in the document um, over the next couple days and have a few more Q&A sessions. Okay, the queue is hot. I've got four left, so let's start working through them. Talk fast. Okay. Uh, I have, I, I've been looking forward to actually looking at the material to, to get a, a better sense of, you know, how I would, how I would use it in the classroom. I, I did have a question about the pre-work that the students do at home, and I guess it's about the mechanics of, do they get uh, feedback before they come into class on whether they're on the right track or not because you know two things I could see happening if not is that they would come in thinking they knew something they didn't and then you know they're thrown for a loop when they get in here or um, just the frustration of not knowing because we, we tend when we're using computers to expect if not instant feedback um, you know uh, soonish feedback and um, so, so that that's my question on that. So. Um, Adria or Danica, who was with Mike? Just to briefly answer that, um, a lot of the pre work is auto graded, so the students do receive instantaneous feedback, and they can repeat the quizzes or the activity as many times as they need. Um, there is, as we will mention, the important word learn activity. Um, there is one activity in a learn that is instructor graded because it. It provides pronunciation um, feedback. Um, so that just depends on how quick your instructor is able to give feedback on an activity. But they do get um, uh, instantaneous feedback. And also discussion boards would need to have instructor feedback given. But we have a rubric in there. So in some cases, it could just be click, click, click in the rubric. And the instructors can decide how much feedback or how much correction they want to do. Adria, you look like you want to say yeah, something. Yeah, I was just, I will just add a little bit, a little bit more on that, though I know we have more questions, but um, essentially, you know, they, before they come to class, they'll get some feedback on what they've, what they've done, and then some will be maybe extended out over time, and some of that depends, I guess, on the, um, your instructional schedule. If you're meeting daily, then you may have students who, if you meet in the morning, they may do their assignment in the morning. You as an instructor aren't gonna get in there before you see them, but it just depends sort of on your your cycle. Um, but, but it's worth knowing, and you'll see much more of this in our focus sessions that we'll do this afternoon and throughout tomorrow. Um, essentially, in their pre-work, they will likely have two or three type of input kinds of activities for some presentation. Um, and then they'll probably have one or two kind of practice slash um, li little bit of production type activities. And with those, anything that's a submission task, as Danica mentioned, they'll it'll typically be something that's auto graded. Um, it may be rubric graded, in which case they'll be waiting for their instructor. So yeah, they will get some. I just want you to know that some of what they do as pre-work is just receiving, it's just receptive. And then some of it will be maybe one or two submission tasks. Yeah. 
Um, I have a question, and maybe Les could help me. I'm in a similar situation as Judith, where our students, uh, we used to do the pilot, and they had they got to take the laptops home, but now we're doing a modified version at our school, and we're doing the same thing where we do the pre-work in class. A lot of us do, not everyone, but out in the community with the more low-income students who don't have laptops and Wi-Fi. My class those quarters that way. We have continuous entry, and most of our classes are level one through three or level one through four combined in the community. So student, when the new students come in and they're, we're doing the pre-work all together, I'm running around, we don't have a tech coach, and having new students just do the flashcards while everyone else is working through the whole learn and maybe moving on to the discussion. I would love, I don't know if any of you have that situation or anyone else here today has that situation. I'm trying to figure out, is there, are there ideas on how to deal with that? Um, or not, <laughs> no. <laughs> Julie, are you asking for ideas on how to get them past getting stuck at the top of the learn without moving on? Or I well, want to make sure I'm, I understand the I question. I have an hour maybe to do the fa or the pre-work in sure. class. Uh -huh. So if I have brand new students who are uh, level one Where and to have, them focus. have high level threes who've been there for a year, they're like zipping through the learn. Mm -hmm. And then the low ones are only doing flashcards. And maybe that's all I can expect of them. I've, I've observed classes in the community mm -hmm. with the same thing with some of the assignments, they're copying the paragraph and typing it rather, I don't know if we just make the best of it or if someone has ideas on how to handle that when they don't have Wi-Fi access outside of class. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk more about it as you know, sort of as the day the day sure. and the two days go on. But just a, one real quick thing that I'll offer is keeping in mind that so many of the the handouts and things that would be you know the same information that's going to be presented in Canvas are available to us through the Google Drive. We'll get there. I promise. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, and so a lot of those things will be things that you could download and provide in a handout form or in a packet form, so that students could have other access to that same kind of content and then when they see it on the computer that could be their first or their second it could be the first time they see it or the second time they see it but they can look at it at home on paper in addition prior to class or after as a follow-up just so that they, they can get it in multiple modes that's a quick answer yeah I have a follow-up to uh, the person who raised the question about employment outcomes. So we've been doing IDEA for a few years and because it's, you can mix and match the modules and customize them for your own purpose, our, our classes are all work focused. So we've selected the IDEA modules that are solely employment related. And as part of the class, we do mock interviews where we bring in real employers from the community. So as part of the tailored idea you're able to customize with 20%, you know, use 80% of the idea curriculum, customize 20%. So the mock interview events is part of the customization we do to enhance the employment outcomes. I know I have one hand here, but I do think I forgot a hand. It does happen on occasion. So raise your hand again if you were the hand that I forgot. It will forgot to raise your hand. Okay, here, nowhere else. So we have got two questions left, and I think that'll be just perfect. So I'm curious if the um, curriculum actually is aligned with the college and career readiness standards? It's aligned. So it will meet every WIOA requirement there is. Math is integrated into every modules. We've correlated to the CCRs, but rather than correlating to a specific CCR, we correlated to the anchor standards to leave room for scaffolding. And so um, there's an example instructional guide in um, the conference program, but you will also be seeing instructional guides throughout the focus sessions with the curricula, but there's math, there's the technology, the CCRs, everything is, re is in there. The only thing we did not do is include the ELPs because we felt they were scaffolding and we're supposed to be teaching to the CCRs, so we're leaving it up to programs to bring in the ELPs. Uh, my name is Diana and I'm here from Seattle Goodwill. And I wanted to add um, from uh, all of you that are in Seattle, 
Uh, if your students have a Seattle Public Library card, they can get a hotspot for free and they, lo they loan them for three weeks. Uh, we are lucky at Seattle Goodwill that we have a partnership with them and they allow our students to keep their hotspots for three months and it's for free. Um, my question is, you are giving them, the students, a laptop, a hotspot for almost a year. At the end of the year, they're thinking that they're going to keep that computer and you're giving them those tools. What happens at the end? They're going to come to you and they're going to say, can I keep the computer? How can I get my own computer? <laughs> um, well, one thing I would say is they were checked in quarterly and in most cases by the libraries at the college because that would be the entity who could place a hold more easily. They have been checked out of basic skills directors' offices in some cases, in some cases e-learning or the IT department. But there's use agreements, so the students were checking them back in, they were being re-imaged, they were being updated because some colleges put them in deep freeze, so things that we need to rent Canvas would no longer work. So they were in the habit of bringing them back on a quarterly basis and turning them back in. and I think it was pretty clearly communicated. I'm not saying no one misunderstood, but for the most part, it was really clearly communicated that we were loaning these to you as part of your learning. They were coming back to us. Does anyone have a situation that may have been like she just described? No, and I will actually add, um, I've had students, and I know I'm not the only one, who have said, thanks, but no thanks, I would rather not take on the risk of borrowing, borrowing that computer. And if they have the ability to do so, would you know, research and get help to purchase their own low cost if need be uh, device so that they can do it. So it's actually been almost the opposite, yeah. But I do have to say in all these years, very few have been lost, damaged, stolen, I think maybe I've heard of six instances, and we're going on six years now. So they're coming back, students are taking care of them, but yes, I have heard a lot of the cases where, um, can we just use ours because we don't want to sign this use agreement, which in some cases is intimidating. I saw kind of a hand go up and down, so did we have one more question? We can take one more, it's right here. With my it's right here. Um, I'm Margie from Goodwill Easter Seals in Mobile, Alabama. We seem to have a, a little different problem from what you're describing of the, the low-level people. We have doctors and accountants and people with professional degrees. How do the modules fit with them? Can they be modified to, because they're not going to go for their GEDs or go to college? You, now that they're open, I would say look at the topics and see what might fit the needs of your students, because I'm assuming they have degrees from their countries, but they're coming in and just need the English. I would look and see which ones might speak to them the most to get them started. The other thing is, because you have a template now to do this, you could very well work with a group of instructors and use the model to bring in some of your own modules following, you know, you can take the Canvas background pages and edit them and make them what you would want also. But that's the joy of it being open. You don't necessarily have to follow our structure. Um, you can take and tweak and modify or just use the format to develop your own. I will add uh, that, again, I, I will always come back to this idea of there kind of being three distinct things going on when we're teaching in this model. And one is the language education, one is the technology skills building, and the other is the thematic content. And so um, every student is getting a, really a different experience every quarter depending on what they come in, in with and what you know we can talk more and probably will about how this is a really um, differentiation friendly differentiation leaning kind of, of instructional model just because of that there's so much going on at once but rather than that being 
making it too something that's too big to attack. It just means that it's really rich. And so for a student who maybe um, has the tech skills already, but they need the language and they can learn some new other kind of skill in their in their life, depending on the the content of the theme of that particular module. So as Jody said, you can um, you know prioritize certain modules over others. Um, maybe say, well, I think our our people will already know this content theme, um, but we can spend less time on it, but they can get some language attached to it. Maybe there are some other themes where that one might be new for them. Let's work on that. It's a U.S. history module. Let's do that one. That could be really useful. And then they'll also certainly be getting the language and the tech skills to go along with it. So I, I do hope that you'll be able to find a good use for it as well. And one other thing I really like about the curriculum, and I'm sorry because I can't see over there, uh, about the curriculum is that this is really connected to life, adult learner life. So when we're talking about the themes, and as you saw just briefly, and we'll be walking through more later, uh, those students who come in with professional backgrounds or you know, higher education, uh, they can still really get the language they need within a framework that they'll find relevancy to their, their life. And just to mention one thing I had, there's a math basics unit. If anybody else was like, math. I was very scared about math being included. I'm like, I'm not a math teacher. And I also like how it's woven in here, but there is one module called Math Basics. And I had a class of students who were obviously very good at math, and we made it through the whole module really quickly when we were looking at like how to do math, but the word problems were a huge stumbling block. So I just found the sweet spot within what was already there and had to modify a little, but I could take the base of what was there and make it work for them. And they loved the unit because that's what they needed from that, from that piece. So I don't know if that answers some of it. <laughs> there, are, I'm going to also. Yeah, also. <laughs> um, there are some uh, modules that will require a little bit of preparation on your part because you have to adapt them to your local situation. And you can always do that. Um, one great idea, things that I do a lot in my classroom is I, I bring in speakers from the community uh, so that they can add a little bit of uh, uh, just, just extra challenge. And so we take it just to another level by bringing somebody in who's a real expert on a subject. Okay, so we're going to wrap this Q&A session if there's something, and I do realize that when we give the opening presentation in the morning, it's kind of like getting hit by a fire hose and it's just information overload. As you're working through the sessions today and over lunch and whatnot, if you do have questions that pop up, please do put them in the Google Doc. We will loop back around to them. And the Google Doc is organized by opening and then by each session individually so we can try to keep the questions kind of differentiated. So please don't hesitate to use that. Um, Will and I have a couple announcements. So I believe, and I have to say a huge shout out, there were only four Canvas invitations that were not accepted this morning, which made us all very, very excited because there have been times when we've done these where we've had um, 20, 30 people who still need help getting in Canvas um, in the morning. So much appreciation to that. If you still need help getting in, please do see us at lunch uh, because you will need to have access um, for the focus session after lunch.